I'm Dr. Kathleen Nadeau. I'm delighted to be with you, and I want to talk to you about a very important issue, which is how lifestyle choices will determine your future. Brain-friendly daily habits essential to extending and improving your life. I'll talk about Russ Barkley's research on the lifespan of adults with ADHD, Dr. Dale Bredesen's research on improving cognitive functioning. Dr. Bredesen is not a name known to the ADHD community, but he's done wonderful research on the impact of lifestyle on cognitive functioning in general. Brain-friendly daily habits that'll improve your life, will extend your life, and also a little bit about the hard work of making and maintaining the lifestyle changes I'm going to be talking about. First, let's talk about the magic pill. I call it the magic pill because people have very unrealistic expectations of what stimulant medication will do for them. It's the go-to treatment for most adults. When adults are diagnosed with ADHD, they assume that the diagnosis is going to lead to medication, or they're worried that the diagnosis will lead to medication. But at any rate, most people think that's the most common issue, the most common approach for treating ADHD. It's easy, it's available. There are a lot of places in the country where it's not available. And for that reason, uh, it's helpful for many. However, research shows us that people rarely continue taking medication throughout their lives. And even when they're taking medication, uh, as the saying goes, pills don't build skills. Pills don't suddenly make us understand how to better manage our life and reach our goals. The research says that Evidence-based treatment, the ideal evidence-based treatment, includes both medication and therapy. But what does that mean? What kind of therapy? Standard psychotherapy? Coaching? Mindfulness? What kind of therapy? Therapy that improves cognitive functioning. Standard psychotherapy certainly can improve functioning. Um, many people have found it helpful for anxiety, for depression, for relationship issues. But many of those same people come to my clinic saying the therapy never really addressed my ADHD. Coaching can be extremely helpful, but it's limited. Coaches are not psychotherapists. Coaching focuses mostly on executive functioning issues, reaching goals, developing habits, self-management, daily life management, but without addressing all the myriad issues that we live with as adults with ADHD, all the low self-esteem issues, self-doubt issues, relationship challenges, etc., that go along with it. Then there's mindfulness. Dr. Lydia Zylowska, uh, has done a wonderful job of developing a mindfulness treatment program for ADHD that certainly has been shown to reduce ADHD symptoms, but it doesn't build life management skills. And then there's what I'm going to talk about today, which is brain-friendly daily habits that are critical to cognitive functioning, but brain-friendly daily habits aren't really talked about in any therapeutic model. First of all, let's look at Russ Barkley's very distressing message. He has found that adults with combined type ADHD extend into adulthood. That means that they still qualify for a diagnosis as adults. Um, have a lifespan that is 12.7 years less than the average adult without ADHD. That's a pretty alarming figure. Um, for example, the average lifespan of an American male at this point in time is about 78 years. So let's do the math. 78 
68, 65, that you're going to live 13 years less almost than the average adult with ADHD. Well, how can that be? Russ Barkley attributes it to traits associated with ADHD, to health habits, to executive functioning issues, and also to psychiatric conditions that are so commonly accompany ADHD. First, let's look at the traits that Barkley uh, outlined. Low conscientiousness. In other words, he's defining conscientiousness as the ability to delay immediate gratification. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with the marshmallow test that was given to children many, many years ago at Stanford University. The test was very simple. A child sat at a table, a marshmallow was placed in front of them. The uh, researcher said, I'm going to leave the room for a few minutes. If you haven't eaten the marshmallow, by the time I get back, I'm going to give you another marshmallow. So if, if I wait, I get two marshmallows, but I'm looking at that marshmallow, it really looks good to me, and I want it. Well, guess what? Uh, if you look at the long-term outcome of those kids, the ones that ate the marshmallow versus the ones that waited, as you're probably not surprised to hear, the ones that were able to wait when they were five or six years old grew up to be adults who were also still able to wait for gratification, meaning that many of them were very successful in their careers after having completed undergraduate education and graduate or professional education, uh, unlike their peers that ate the marshmallow right away. Inability to delay gratification, I want what I want when I want it, inability to override that uh, is linked to lower education levels, lower income, and financial problems that are only increased, not by the lower income alone, but also by impulsive spending. I want what I want when I want it. Impulsivity, the act now, think later approach to life, leads to more life crises and to chronic stress. And interpersonal hostility or aggression, another trait identified by Berkeley, leads to poor relationships, to violent encounters, and of course to injuries in those violent encounters. Now let's look at the poorer health habits. What Berkeley found is that People with combined type ADHD in adulthood have poor nutrition patterns, more reliance on fast food, on junk food. They're more likely to be obese. Uh, they're more likely to lack exercise in their life, to have poor sleeping habits. They're more likely to smoke cigarettes and they show patterns of greater alcohol consumption as well as other substances. These same folks have executive functioning deficits. Well, what does that mean in daily life? It means that these people are less able to restrain themselves when they have a feeling they're more likely to act on it. Uh, they have struggles with time management, with organization and problem solving, emotional self-regulation. In other words, they lead a very temperamental, emotionally reactive life, and they also struggle with self-motivation, getting themselves up off the couch to do a task or to take the next step toward reaching an important goal. Barclay outlined what he thinks of as the most commonly associated psychopathologies as hostility. Hostility leading to higher stress, failed relationships, social isolation to depression, and to anxiety. And as we know, depression and anxiety are very commonly found among adults with ADHD. There's also a problem of coordination of care between ADHD specialists and other specialists. The most common coexisting conditions include substance abuse and addictions, uh, in all the years that I've been in this field, I've found very, very few people in the substance abuse community that 
understand that ADHD needs to be treated in combination with substance abuse problems. Same thing for eating disorders. Uh, it's more and more recognized in the eating disorders community that many people in treatment for serious eating disorders have ADHD, and yet they don't seem to have developed a program that addresses the ADHD while at the same time addressing the eating disorders. Learning disorders, we're all familiar with. So many children are diagnosed with ADHD and learning disorders. Language disorders, likewise. Obsessive compulsive disorder, personality disorders, and hormone dysregulation. Another thing that we don't hear a lot about, but in that relatively small community of specialists in women's ADHD issues, we know that hormones play a huge role. Um, hormone dysregulation starting with the beginning of adolescence, uh, when young girls go through puberty and their ADHD suddenly takes off. Um, hormone dysregulation at perimenopause around age 39 or 40, all the way to 10 or 11 years later when women hit menopause. So Barclay's research also tells us that ADHD treatment has not focused enough on addressing the right issues. And what he means by the right issues and what I'm talking about as the right issues are the issues that lead to that startlingly shorter lifespan. Before we look at what ADHD treatment should look like, I'd like to take a moment to talk about Barclay's discouraging findings. It's important to know that there are mitigating factors, and that is that people of higher intelligence and people of more education are much less likely to fall into this pattern and therefore much less likely to have such a shortened lifespan. It's primarily combined type ADHD with impulsivity and hyperactivity um, that leads to this very discouraging shortened lifespan. So what should treatment look like? We should get away from a narrow focus on attention. Uh, the name attention deficit implies that that's the main issue, but it's far from the main issue. We now know, of course, that there are all kinds of executive functioning challenges and lifestyle patterns and proclivities and comorbidities that all play an important role. So we should stop focusing just on attention. We need to focus more on the health habits and the poor life management habits associated with ADHD. And that's a dangerous cycle. I mean, ADHD leads to self-destructive habits and those self-destructive habits like poor diet, uh, little exercise, poor sleep, only add to our ADHD challenges. So treatment should focus on building better executive functioning skills, life management skills, and also on building brain healthy daily habits. So what should we do to build a more functional, satisfying lifestyle? That's the main focus of my talk today. Before all else, build an ADD-friendly posse. And what I mean by that is that we need to find a group of people, to create a group of people, if we don't have such a group, that supports us and understands us. We discover our strengths in interactions with like-minded people. I can't tell you how therapeutic many adults with ADHD find support groups or therapy groups with other adults with ADHD. Finally, they find themselves in a group of people that really get them, that accept them, and approach each other with a supportive, helpful mindset. Feeling misunderstood and criticized by others is the most damaging of all ADHD fallout. Children with ADHD grow up under a reign of criticism from parents, coaches, teachers, you name it. Adults that think if they just tried harder, they could quit acting the way they act. 
support from others with ADHD allows us to learn from each other. I've heard some amazingly creative solutions come from adult ADHD support groups. Support lowers our stress level and helps us endure, helps us problem solve. We need an ADHD friendly posse. Let's start by seeking a good night's sleep. There's nothing more important to brain functioning than getting adequate sleep. The average American typically sleeps, working adult American typically is sleep deprived by at least an hour a day. And that sleep deprivation is cumulative. And guess what? With this cumulative effect, it really gives us a double dose of ADHD. So what's so hard about getting enough sleep? Well, it's not just young adults that resist healthy sleeping patterns. I've worked with countless older adults who just can't seem to get themselves to bed, sometimes intentionally. Many mothers have told me that's the only time I have to myself. It's worth it to be tired, to have an hour or two to myself late in the evening. Um, a lot of people with ADHD report that's their most productive time. If they have something to write, they seem to get it done better late at night. I think part of that is that's a time when everyone else is asleep, when there are fewer distractions. And then there is the reality that many adults with ADHD struggle with delayed sleep phase syndrome, um, which means that they just naturally don't get tired at the same time as others. Um, it's a sh shift in circadian rhythm and it can be altered with consistent effort, but very few people make that effort. They just say, I'm a night owl and I've learned to get by on five and a half or six hours of sleep during the week. Uh, then of course they're exhausted, they sleep in on the weekend, and that makes it even harder to get to sleep Sunday night when the school week or work week starts all over again. So what do you do? Let's talk a little bit about getting a good night's sleep, but I want to explain to you that there are more intensive treatments for people who really struggle and desperately need a better night's sleep. So if you're gonna try it on yourself uh, to manage changing your sleep patterns, the first step is prepare for tomorrow. I mean, I try to make a practice of looking at my schedule for tomorrow, looking at my to-do list for tomorrow, so that I can go to bed feeling that I'm prepared, I'm organized, and I'm not worrying about having forgotten something. It's really important not to have screen time for the last hour before bed. As many of you know, now it's become quite well known that our screens emit blue light and blue light stops melatonin production, which is the naturally occurring hormone that allows us to feel sleepy. So no screen time, we need that melatonin. Develop a regular bedtime. Um, Taking a warm bath or shower is very sleep inducing. As our bodies cool off after the warm shower, we naturally become sleepy. Relaxation exercises, stretching, tai chi, mindfulness can be very helpful. Reading quietly, as long as it's not a thriller, as long as it's not a page turner that's gonna keep you up so you can find out what happened next. Um, a lot of people find that they use their iPhone to get to sleep, that they might listen quietly uh, to some kind of podcast or music because it distracts them from all the thoughts racing around in their hyperactive brain. No caffeine after lunch and no chocolate in the evening. That's because chocolate also has caffeine in it, of course. So the next thing, after a good night's sleep, if we've managed to get that, is a high protein breakfast and protein based snacks throughout the day. Why protein? Because protein metabolizes a lot more slowly, so it gives us a very stable blood glucose level all day long, and that's what our brains run on. That's brain fuel. 
learning and decision making are much, much harder when we have lower blood glucose levels. We get cognitive, cognitively fatigued, we make poor choices, we avoid things, uh, we aren't as efficient if our blood glucose level goes down. Protein can keep it up during the day. I really encourage my clients to keep things around that are easy to grab, that are low sugar and high protein. One of my go-tos is to always have hard boiled eggs around. Let's talk a minute as, now that we're on nutrition about eating disorders and disordered eating. Um, many, many people with ADHD have disordered eating patterns, even though the majority of them say, I don't have an eating disorder. And by that, I mean binge eating, compulsive overeating, uh, snacking in front of Netflix all evening long, um, getting snacks late at night. Um, I think we really need to expand the DSM so that we have um, actual disordered eating labels to understand what's going on with people with ADHD. And we need to develop programs specifically designed for those with ADHD. So often the disordered eating or eating disorders uh, have to do with impulse control, which makes sense with ADHD, with poor planning, having a healthy, high protein, uh, low sugar diet requires planning. I mean, most of the things that we can grab and go are not very good for us. Most of them are high in starch, high in sugar or fat. Uh, people use food for self-medication and for some, it's just self-stimulation. I'm at home, I'm bored, and there's always the pantry or the refrigerator. Of course, what happens is that over time, this kind of eating leads to obesity, and obesity is absolutely associated with cognitive decline, starting in middle age. There are also nutritional supplements that can support brain functioning. It's a very complex issue. Um, it's not one size fits all. We need individual testing to really know what vitamins or supplements, minerals are deficient in a given person. Um, but we do know a few things. For example, curcumin uh, is good to reduce inflammation throughout the body, including the brain. Uh, inflammation is the culprit that leads to most chronic diseases that are lifestyle related including Alzheimer's. And there's a general consensus that B12 and omega-3 fatty acids are important, as well as vitamin D, which we can get uh, simply by going outside on a daily basis and exposing ourselves to a few moments of sunlight. There's a lot, lot more to know about nutritional supplements, uh, and this lecture is far too broad in its focus and far too short to go into them. I don't mean to shortchange them, but to just mention that those are a very important part of boosting our brain functioning. I know that John Rady is talking at this conference and he's, I'm sure, gonna be focusing on the incredible importance of aerobic exercise for good cognitive functioning. Uh, what aerobic exercise does in only 20 minutes um, at minimum, 20 to 30 minutes a day, can significantly boost our levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, this is a neurochemical in our brain that basically promotes learning. Uh, some people humorously refer to it as the miracle grow of the brain. BDNF promotes the development of new neurons. It promotes the development and growth of dendrites. And dendrites are those tiny filaments that connect our neurons in the brain. And they're the physical manifestation of learning. So 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, and it doesn't have to be hugely athletic. You need to get your 
pulse rate up to 80% of the maximum pulse rate that is appropriate for your age. It's easy to look up on the internet and keep it at that level. Um, you can keep it at that level in many cases simply by walking very briskly for 20 or 30 minutes. So you don't have to turn into a super athlete to get BDNF into your brain. Um, it really helps with restlessness, with hyperactivity. It puts our brains in gear and ready to focus. Exercise also increases serotonin, which is uh, what helps regulate our mood, make us feel better, and dopamine, of course, the focus uh, neurochemical that is promoted through stimulant medication. So this is John's book. I hope you all listen to his lecture. I'm certainly going to try to listen to it. It's an amazing story of just some remarkable uh, changes in people's lives that have occurred through regular um, aerobic exercise. Take a green break. I mean, that sounds nice, that sounds relaxing, feels good to get outside, but it's so much more than that. There's really a fairly sizable body of research that shows us that ADHD symptoms decline as our exposure to nature increases. There's a reason um, that we feel better when we're outside. They did a remarkable experiment with children with ADHD in which they measured in tiny increments the amount of exposure that these children had to nature. And the smallest increment was a house plant in the school classroom. And the largest was we're spending a day in the woods hiking with everything in between. They found that children's ADHD symptoms declined when they were playing on grass in comparison to asphalt. Um, if they went for a walk in a green tree-filled area, not an urban area, but green and tree-filled, again, ADHD symptoms declined. It calms us down. Uh, it helps us focus. And what I realize when I'm talking about all these things that we need to do, brain-friendly, daily habits is that we've developed a lifestyle in the 20th and 21st centuries that are really brain unfriendly. We've developed a lifestyle where we sit down most of the time, we stay inside most of the time, we don't move, we're not exposed to nature, we have too much food to eat and not enough opportunity to burn off those calories, and we're exposed to fast food, fattening food, and junk food. And I think this ha has come along in uh, greater and greater proportions the more women are in the workforce now. We simply don't have time to cook the nutritious meals that mothers who worked exclusively at home were able to do a couple of generations ago. So we've sort of set up a situation where we really have to counteract the way most people around us are living in order to have brain healthy daily habits. We need to get back to nature, get back to healthy food, get back to moving. This is some of the research that I mentioned, in case you're interested and would like to read more about it. Um, and there's a lot more where this came from that there really is um, a tremendous benefit from getting outside. And just personally, I can share with you that during this time of COVID, I've been working at home for the past five months. I have a home office. I'm talking to you right now from my home office, but I've also created what I refer to as my outdoor office. I have a deck, with an area of overhang, so I'm out of the sun, out of the rain, and I keep a table and a chair out there. And frequently I'll take my laptop out and conduct psychotherapy sessions, consultations, staff meetings from my outdoor office. And it feels wonderful 
to be there, to feel the air moving, to see the trees, to hear the birds. It's good for the soul. Uh, and it's good for our brains to be outside. There is a positive relationship between stress and ADHD symptoms. The more stress we feel, the greater our ADHD symptoms. Let's, let's take a look at why ADHD tends to lead to more stress. Um, let's just start with poor time awareness. We're all familiar with that. Um, people with ADHD are very bad, typically at estimating how long something is going to take. They're bad at being always aware of, I need to leave in 10 minutes, I need to leave in five minutes. Poor time awareness typically leads to overcommitment because we don't really understand how long something's going to take us. And overcommitment leads to stress. Poor time awareness leads to the stress of always running late. If you start off late and go through your day apologizing again and again, so sorry, I got off to a late start this morning, the traffic was terrible, and therefore you're late for every appointment, every meeting throughout the day because you're running behind. That's a very stressful way to go through life. And then there's the stress caused by disorganization of never sorting the mail, never opening the mail on time, not developing a routine of paying the bills on time, filing your taxes, filing insurance claims. That leads to a high stress life as well. Many people, many adults with ADHD are in jobs that are a very poor match for them. Um, a job that requires them to have more executive functioning skills than they have, a job that requires them to work faster, more efficiently than they're able to, and ADD unfriendly work is a constant stressor. I do a lot of career assessment and career counseling with adults with ADHD. Um, just as we work hard with children to try to help them change patterns in the classroom or find a different classroom or a different school that's a better match, um, I see the work I do with adults around careers in a very similar way. <coughs> Excuse me. So ADD unfriendly work increases stress. Then poor sleep patterns increase stress. We've already talked about it. People who routinely deprive themselves of enough sleep, they can't get to sleep at night. And then of course, they're very tired when they wake up in the morning. And guess what? Those same people self-medicate throughout the day with caffeine, with sugar, uh, and those lead to boom or bust blood glucose levels which is ever more stressful. The impulsivity of ADHD can lead to stress. If we impulsively spend money, then we have money problems. If we're impulsively reactive and angry, we have relationship problems. Uh, impulsivity can lead to all kinds of legal problems. We forgot to pay the fine. We didn't notice that we were driving over the speed limit. There are all kinds of things that people with ADHD do um, not intentionally, uh, that lead to legal problems. And poor emotional regulation uh, can lead to relationship stress. As we all know, the um, likelihood of divorce among adults with ADHD is much higher than in the general population. And a lot of that is due to a number of things, including disorganization, uh, People who are not ADHD can get very tired of having to be the organizer and the reminder, and also to poor emotional regulation when everything becomes a non-constructive fight rather than a constructive problem-solving discussion. So one of the things that I do in treating people with ADHD is to ask them to do a stress analysis. I'll sit there with them and say, let's make a list of all of your stressors. And stressors come in many different shapes and sizes. 
um, raising children with ADHD, which is very likely if you're an adult with ADHD, uh, is a major stressor. Um, having a long commute and busy traffic is a major stressor. Um, having money problems is a chronic stressor. Uh, having family problems is a major stressor. Marital problems, what are all the major stressors? And then let's look at which ones can be addressed through lifestyle changes. I mean, in many cases, I have strongly advised um, my clients that you either need to change jobs or change houses, that it just doesn't make sense for you to be spending two and a half hours out of every workday on the road because of the distance between where you live and where you work. So what can we do to reduce stress through problem solving? Um, sometimes I talk about financial management. How can we get your debt load down? Uh, is there a consolidation loan that might be helpful so that you're not worried every single month, am I gonna be able to pay my bills? Which bills do I have to leave unpaid? Which is also highly stressful. And what kinds of things can you introduce into your life to deal with the stressors that can't be eliminated? Um, if we have children with ADHD, um, that is a chronic stressor, but one of the things that you can introduce into your life is to take a parenting class, um, which gives you lots of tools, very effective tools, for lowering the conflict level and the stress level between you and your child. There are wonderful courses to reduce stress in a marital relationship. There are things that can be done to reduce stress with the chronic stressors in your life. And then there's mindfulness. Um, this is Lydia Zylowska. I mentioned her earlier. Um, Lydia is a psychiatrist. And so I thought the name of her book was very well chosen, The Mindfulness Prescription for Adult ADHD. In other words, Lydia is prescribing mindfulness rather than medication. She did research when she was at UCLA that demonstrated that going through an eight-week mindfulness course that she developed specifically for adults with ADHD uh, was very successful in reducing ADHD symptoms. Um, Dr. Zylowska is about to come out with a clinician's manual. I'm eagerly looking forward to reading it. Uh, a manual for clinicians that want to lead one of her mindfulness groups. Mindfulness techniques that are friendly for people with ADHD include meditation in motion. A lot of people with ADHD say, I could never get into mindfulness. I can't sit still long enough. It makes me feel agitated to even contemplate it. Well, guess what? It's very possible to be mindful while moving, while walking, while doing Tai Chi, while doing yoga. And often that's a better match for someone with ADHD to do mindfulness while you're moving. Breath awareness. We all know about the magical calming properties of slow, deep breathing. But what you may not realize is that even a few slow, deep breaths periodically throughout the day, whenever you're feeling stressed, can significantly reduce your stress level. I have a smart watch, I have an Apple watch, and it keeps track of my resting pulse rate throughout the day. So I have an automatic measure of how calm I've been able to keep myself during the day. It's, it's a good measure of how am I doing? And I work hard to keep my resting pulse rate low. Building an ADD friendly lifestyle. What do I mean by that? Many people with ADHD live in ADHD toxic family groups. They may have a parent or a spouse who's very intolerant of ADHD patterns. 
who may believe that you could just stop doing this if you decided to. If you tried harder, you could stop being this way. You could stop being late. You could stop losing your car keys. You could stop forgetting things I've told you. And if you're living in that kind of a family household, then it's going to take a very heavy toll on you on a daily basis. So we really need to educate the people close to us. It can be very life-changing to bring your skeptical spouse into an adult ADHD life skills group or support group where they can hear other people that struggle with exactly the kinds of things that you're struggling with. Engage in collaborative problem solving. Instead of getting angry over and over and over again in a family because you're always forgetting to do something or doing it badly, um, problem solve with your spouse. Um, assign yourself tasks that you're much less likely to forget. Tasks that are less likely to forget are tasks that happen every single day at the same time. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, I was working with a father and adolescent son, and the father was very angry, critical toward his ADHD son. And he said, I don't ask him to do very much. In fact, basically, the main chore he has is to take the garbage cans up to the end of the driveway once a week in preparation for the garbage truck. But he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it unless I remind him. And often I'll remind him, he'll say, I want to do it later, I'm in the middle of something, and then he forgets again. Drives me crazy. I ask so little of him. And I said to that dad, well, I understand your frustration, but think about it. If your son has an issue with forgetfulness, then it's much more likely he's going to forget something that only happens once a week. He has to realize that it's Thursday night, I have to take the cans out, and then I have to stop what I'm doing and do it. Why not assign him tasks that occur every single day? That I want you to come home and empty the dishwasher um, before dinner every day or help clean up the kitchen after dinner every day. Something that happens routinely and something where there are reminders around. Your son's not intentionally forgetting to take the garbage cans out. You just take something that is gonna be especially hard for him to remember. Remove distractions and temptations. You know, as I often tell people, if you're trying to eat healthier diet, if you're trying to lose a little weight, then you probably don't want to leave a package of Oreo cookies on the kitchen counter. You are almost destined to eat them as you pass back and forth. So put temptations away where you don't see them, where they're not beckoning to you. And as much as you can, remove distractions if you're trying to do something that requires concentration, like homework, like work that you've take brought home from the office and talk to your family about the need for those distractions. I need to work for an hour without interruption. Daily routines that support brain healthy habits. If the whole family gets on board with good sleep patterns, nutritious, healthy eating patterns, daily exercise, then you're going to be supporting each other uh, in habits that are going to support your brain functioning. Meeting the challenges of ADHD. It's really important to take charge. Uh, don't rely just on medication. Don't rely on advice from others. Uh, rely on what you learn, on your intelligence, on what you learn from support groups. Uh, don't place yourself in the victim role. Take charge of your ADHD. There are lots of things you can do to reduce the negative impact on your life. Take responsibility. Um, ADHD is not an excuse, it's an explanation. Uh, it's really important to the people around you, the people that you work with, the people that you live with, that you acknowledge your challenges, that you don't make excuses, and that you actively work to problem solve. Like I did with that father about the son 
who kept forgetting to take the garbage cans down to the end of the driveway. It's important to problem solve. Maybe at work, you're being assigned the wrong set of tasks, tasks that you're less likely to be able to do a good job of. And take heart. There are lots of adults with ADHD leading successful lives. Um, and your goal is to become one of them. You need role models. And there are plenty of role models out there. And I think most important, and this goes back to creating an ADD friendly family, it's important to laugh, to forgive yourself. Your goal is not perfection. Your goal is to focus on what matters to you and to manage the rest as best you can. It's so important if there are multi-generations of people in your family with ADHD that you serve as a role model, a role model for problem solving, but also a role model for forgiving yourself, for forgiving your children, for encouraging one another uh, to meet the challenges of ADHD. It's also important, although another topic altogether, uh, to realize that there are many positive things that are associated with ADHD. Things that you don't read a lot about because mostly we're overly focused on the problems. But having ADHD uh, very often means that you have a very curious brain, that you take enormous interest in many, many things in life, that you're an out-of-the-box thinker, a creative problem solver, uh, often a very fun and interesting person. So it's, it's very important to get away from the attitude that the perfect life is a life of complete order. Um, you need to put order in your life to the extent that it's causing you stress and difficulties. Nothing more than that. So, going back to what should effective ADHD treatment focus on, it should have a broader focus than most ADHD treatment does uh, on all of the things that I've talked to you about here, on improving your sleep patterns, eating a brain healthy diet, which is um, low on the glycemic scale. In other words, minimizing sugar, starches, and maximizing uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and protein regular aerobic exercise, not just daily exercise, but aerobic exercise, stress reduction, stress management, building executive functioning skills to help you manage your life on a daily basis, and building that ADD friendly environment. If you don't have the good fortune to find yourself in an ADD friendly environment, then start about building one, creating one for yourself and your family you'll all benefit from it. So to maintain an ADHD friendly, healthy lifestyle, uh, sleep, stress management, exercise, exposure to nature, brain friendly nutrition, structure, simplicity, ADD friendly environment, and focusing on the things you love. It's awfully important and a topic for another occasion to talk to all of you about how to go about building these brain-friendly daily habits. There are lots of ways that you can be effective in doing it. It takes time, it takes persistence, it takes support, it takes coaching, but it absolutely can be done and it will lead to a much more satisfying uh, and much more functional life. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. I wish we could be in person um, so that we could go through questions and answers. I'm sure you have a lot of questions at this point, but I'm happy to have had a chance to talk with you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.